Amen. Grab your Bibles. Let's walk through this. I want to pick up where I left off. Um, let me just say, if you uh, did not hear last week's message, um, for context, you can go on iTunes and download the, pod, the podcast, especially if you missed last week. So today, I just want to continue where I left off. I'll review a little bit just to bring you up to speed in case you were not here. But there's a couple of things I want to share, share with you. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming out this past Wednesday. Uh, I need you to come out again because uh, I need to go to some challenging places that we can't go on a Sunday morning. Um, I might hint at some of that this morning. Wednesday's a little safer platform to kind of dialogue about that. So we need to have this conversation. So make sure you come, that God would move and have his way. So we've been studying last week, and to, this week is the last week on this, the book of Philemon. And the issue here is that Paul found himself in Rome, and Onesimus, a runaway slave that belonged to Philemon, ended up in Rome with Paul. The book was written around 80, 60. Um, data shows that Paul was probably in house arrest at Rome at the time that he wrote the, the, the letter. Now, he's writing this letter to uh, Philemon to get Philemon to take Onesimus back into his presence. We don't know the circumstances for sure around which Onesimus um, left where he did to go to Paul. Um, there's a lot of speculation. Uh, traditionally, we've said, uh, you've heard this traditionally, that Onesimus probably stole some money from his master and escaped and ran away to go to where Paul, uh, in Rome somewhere, then bumped into Paul. We don't know how factual that is. We also uh, heard from last week that uh, another speculation is, is that Onesimus and Philemon had some problems. And um, knowing that Philemon and Paul had a relationship, and we'll talk about that in a little while, Onesimus went uh, to Rome to see if Paul could resolve the issue. The third position, which is the one that I hold, is that I believe that the church in Onesimus' house um, had a relationship with Paul, and Paul found himself in prison where he was uh, incapacitated, meaning he couldn't travel as freely as he wanted to. And the church sent Onesimus to, um, back to Paul to minister to him, to help him. It was during that time that Onesimus developed a relationship with Paul, proved himself useful to Paul. And so Paul, he probably overstayed his welcome. Paul is writing this letter back to Philemon to say to him to accept him again. Now, uh, we want to pick this up and talk through it. So the first few verses, Paul kind of just greets um, the church that's there in the home of Philemon. He sends their greet greetings. He thanks God for them in verses, I think that's verse 4 through 7. And then when we get to verse 8, he opens up his dialogue with Philemon by saying to him, considering the fact that I am your overseer, I am covering you, he says, I can command you on how to fix this situation or to receive Onesimus back in your presence. But Paul chooses not to exercise that option, and he wanted Philemon to make the, the choice himself. So it was based on that premise that we had a um, couple of movements that I share with you. The first one being is that any attempts to restore broken relationship should not be done out of compulsion but out of love. Now, what I said about that, and I'll just give you the succinct version so we can get to what I want to share, is that if somebody has to force you to restore relationship, to ask for forgiveness, to receive people again, here is how I said it. There comes a point in time where the problem is no longer with the person, but it's with you. Come on, say amen. And so what Paul is saying to Philemon, listen, I could tell you, but I don't want to tell you what to do. And here's how he said it. Based on your love for God, you'll do the right thing. Come on, amen. Are you with me? And, and what we really fleshed out of, uh, uh, from that point is that if we love God, we learn to do the right thing. In, that, in, in those few verses, Paul addresses uh, Onesimus as his child, a person that he brought to a relationship with God. He refers to himself as Onesimus' father. And then the text continues and moves down, and then we get to verse 15. And I want to read verse 15 specifically so we can set up what I'm going to be talking about in verses um, 17 through 20. Listen to what verse 15 said. And it says this, for perhaps from the ESV, this is why he was parted from you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, a beloved brother, especially for me, 
but how much more for you both in the flesh and in the spirit. We'll deal with verse 15, 16. But listen 15 again. Perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. Now, here, here is, here's, what we shared, here's what we shared about that particular verse, and I'll talk about it briefly as we kind of make the transition. Sometimes, sometimes, I want to make sure I'm getting that right, that, um, no, 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 that, that's kind of out of order. Let me make sure, see, a quick second here, give me a quick second. Yeah, right there. Sometimes, God will allow you, he will allow me, to go through difficult situation so he can transform us. Okay, I, need to, I need to labor, belabor this point because on Wednesday, I want to talk about the national, I want to talk about the cultural, I want to talk about a little bit the problem in America um, because we don't get this. We don't get this. That sometimes God will take us through difficult situations, he will transform us, and then he will restore us. Here is how Paul said it to Philemon, perhaps Philemon, that he was parted from us for a little while so that you can have him back forever. And, and what we extracted from that, that verb, perhaps he was parted from you, it was written in a passive voice, which meant that neither Paul nor Onesimus nor Philemon really um, had, um, had anything to do with, with Onesimus' departure. And what Paul is trying to communicate, God being the subject of that passive verb, maybe God took him away so he can go through what he needed to go through. So when God brings him back, he's completely different. Turn your neighbor, y'all not getting this. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, who I am right now is not who I was yesterday. Yeah, y'all get it now? Okay. Maybe God took you through that thing. Ah, come on now. Such that when he restores you, who you are today is a lot different than who you were yesterday. Now, I don't know about none of y'all in here, but I thank God for my transformation. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God for my transformation. So here's what, here's what. Here is what um, 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 Paul says to Philemon, and hear me say this carefully. Philemon, God took him away. God allowed him to go through what he had to go through. God changed him. Now I am writing you this letter, and I'm really hesitant to use the word restore, but I'll use it in this context, but I'll clean it up later in the message. So now he can be restored to a different place. And I'm saying it like that, Okay. So now, let me, let me hit this point, and then we're going to talk through this so we can kind of hear it. So here's the thing I want y'all to, to get this. Um, once God, once God, no, that's not it either. Um, this thing's all out of order. We'll get it right. Uh, let me see here. I want to get it right here. Yeah. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Y'all bear with me. I'll clean it up. Second service, we'll get it right. So let me see here. Once God transforms us, we're not to be treated nor behave. I got to be slow down on this. As though we are still the old person, we are made new, and I have here, physically and spiritually. I got to flesh that out a little while, okay? Because this is Paul's argument with the book of Philemon, and this is my problem where I am hesitant to use the word restore, okay? Um, because restore has some implications that I don't like. And I want you to hear because this is the depth to me of what Paul is saying about Philemon. And really when it comes to me in having broken relationships interpersonally with, with each other, because I don't understand this, my relationships aren't fixed well. Come on, does this make sense? So look with me at verse 16 and let's walk through this. And I want to talk to what it says here. If you're at verse 16, say amen. So Paul says here... Um, Bring him back, but notice what he says, no longer as a bondservant, some of your translation says as a slave, but more than a bondservant as, or a slave. And then he says, as a beloved brother, especially for me, but how much more for you? And then notice what he says, do it two way, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Okay, and this is where I'm deriving the point because here's what we want to do. We want to be spiritual brothers and not physical brothers. 
Here's what I said Wednesday. I'll forgive you, but I don't have to love you. <laughs> Paul is not saying that, and he's addressing that, and he's dealing with that, and I want us to flesh that out, and I want us to deal with that specifically in the text. So there's a couple of things that I want to highlight in, in the third point that I need you to get to with me. So here's what number three is really saying. Onesimus was not to be received as a slave, okay, but he was supposed to be received more than a slave. Come on, say more than a slave. Say it again. Say more than a slave. Now, now here's a tension with the text that, that, that I can't, I don't have time this morning to go into that we need Wednesday night to really talk about because historically and culturally, Onesimus was a literal slave, and he was a slave that had a slave master or an owner. And here's what I need you to hear me say. When Onesimus left Philemon's house, his status was slave. Come on, y'all, okay? Then he leaves Philemon's house. He finds himself in Rome. He undergoes some sort of a transformation where God does something new in him. But then watch this. Paul now is sending him back home, and notice what he's saying to a slave master. He's saying to the slave master, hey, hey, listen, this brother, don't take him in so much as a slave. Well, don't take him in as a slave, just point blank. But take him in as more than a slave. Now, here's what I need you to hear me say. Let's kind of flesh this out just for a little while. Then Wednesday, we're going to really dig deep into it. The fact is, in Roman culture, slavery still existed. Now, I need to say this to to you and myself as Americans here, is that our perspective of, of slavery in the world is skewed because of what slavery looked like in America. Okay, so, so you need to hear me say this, that slavery existed since the beginning of time. But I'm the guy that's going to say to you, the way it went down in America is not the way it was designed to be. Okay, and so what we do is when we hear the term slavery, our, our, our filters, our perspective is restricted solely here to the confines of the United States, and we don't get a, a, the broader picture. So, so Paul was dealing with some of the same things. So here's what he was saying to Philemon that I need you to hear me say. Philemon, I am not challenging slavery in the Roman culture. I am not challenging the issue of of you being a slave master and Onesimus Onesimus being a slave that works for, that belongs to you, that's owned by you. But what I am saying is that you, you have to deal with the fact that slavery exists in Rome and then you are a Christian with a slave. So here's what this means, Onesimus. I mean Philemon. When Onesimus comes home, Even though Onesimus has to submit to Roman culture, in your house and in your presence, I expect something different. Because here's what that means. You are a Christian first, and you got a slave now that's a Christian first. I wish I had time to really flesh this out, because you got to get this, you got to get this. So when he comes into your house, you don't see his slavery first. You see his Christianity first and who he is, and you treat him like a Christian first before you even address anything having to do with slavery. And lock into this, Philemon, if you can see him as a Christian first, you're going to see this in the text, you'll forget that he's even a slave. Ah, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not the political person. I am not the, the activist, but I have to say this. When I see you and when you see me in the world, we ought to see Christ first Amen. before we see color. Amen. Y'all done got quiet. We, we ought to see Christ first before we reflect on yesteryear. And the church don't get this. So Paul is trying to say to Philemon, we'll talk about this Wednesday, something new has happened. 
I was sharing with Pastor Derek the other day. So I wonder, has the Christian church really studied this passage? Because here's what it looks like. Sometimes I am more married to my political status, meaning if I'm Republican or Democrat, before I get married to Christ. And I fight for my political status as opposed to getting along as a believer in, oh, y'all not. Subtle implications. Subtle, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll get to, I'll leave that alone because I don't want to spend too much time there. So number one, when you bring him back home, see him as a Christian first. He says, see him as a brother in Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you what that means in a little while. Look at number two. So here's what number three also means. Onesimus' transformation, it impacted both his flesh and his spirit, which now made him a beloved brother in Christ. This is deep. This is deep. Because I wish I had time to deal with the historical, cultural stuff. So where, 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 if you were to deal with slavery in the literal sense, where slaves were mistreated and slaves were second-class citizens and slaves were not accepted as members of the household, here is what this meant to Onesim Onesimus and Philemon. When dinner was served, there's not a master's table and a slave's table. Oh. That's what that meant. Receive him as a brother, and this is what I'm trying to communicate as an equal in Christ, right? Now, now notice the third one. So Paul is not calling um, Philemon to, to manumit or to free Onesimus, but establish a different type of a relationship with him based on the transformation that took place. Oh, my gosh. That's heavy because, because when he left your house, um, he was useless. Now he's returning, he is useful. So the relationship where you had, where you were lording over him on his return, there is no more lording over your one in Christ. Oh my gosh, you're, you're, you're one, you're one, you're one. See, I let go of some things. We have to release some things. We have to walk differently. So, so Phile Paul is saying to Philemon, you, I'm not asking you to free him because if you free him, then you don't have to deal with him. Oh, y'all miss that. Y'all miss that. And a lot of us, I'm not saying anything, I'm not saying anything, I'm not saying anything, but a lot of us have been fighting for freedom so we don't have to deal with each other. So here's what it looks like interpersonally. We might have been mad with the ex-husband. So here's what we do, we free him. And here's what we said, the Lord allowed me to release him. <laughs> and you freed him, you manumitted him, you released him. Do you talk to him? Nah, the Lord freed me from that. <laughs> there is no relationship. This is why I'm trying to say to you, the issue is not restoration, because if Philemon were to restore Onesimus, Onesimus, he would have to put him back into position of slavery. I am talking about a change of relationship, not restoration. Whew. That is difficult to deal with because we don't like some people. Let me stay here since I'm on the issue of marriage. Some of us have been divorced for 40 years. And 41 years later, we still don't like him or her. But we'll say we're healed. And the relationship has not changed. I think Paul is challenging that. Come on, say amen if you're with me. Are you with me? So he's talking about something different. And, and, and here, here's where this point comes into play is that he's saying um, he transforms us. He restores us. This is the one I want to get at. Um, that we ought to be not to be treated or behave as though we're still the old person. We have been made new, what? Physically and what? So, so here, here's what that means. If I'm mad with, with Sister Annette, I don't say we connect spirit. I don't have to touch her. I think because the physical said, I got to touch you. You have to hear me. I have to engage you. Because if the spirit is right, it forces the flesh to do the right thing. Y'all say amen to me. I know you don't like this, but because some of us have a whole lot of enemies. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. And now you got to go make it right. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. But if God is in you, 
Your hand, your feet, your mouth, your nose, your ear has no freedom to do what it wants to do. It must do what the God on the inside of you is commanding it to do. So this is why a physical change can take place because a spiritual transformation has occurred on the inside. And if the inside, if God lives on the inside, whatever I do on the outside is a reflection of the God that's on the inside of me. So there is no such thing of me being a believer in Christ and not talking to my enemies. Oh, y'all, let me. Somebody pick up a Bible and throw it, so let me get on back here before I get stoned. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I got to talk to you now. <laughs> yeah. This is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the beauty of the transformative process. This is the beauty of what being like God is all about. Let me play this out for you. You will notice God will be angry with you about your sin, but he'll still love you. He'll still talk to you. He'll still put his arms around you. He'll still minister to you. Come on. He'll still feed you. He'll still clothe you. And if we are supposed to be like God... Philemon, Onesimus is coming home, and he's no longer a slave, he's more than. So deal with yourself <laughs> before he gets here, okay? I'm almost done, I'm almost done. So look at this, then verse 17. So once restored, don't, don't. Do not, we should not keep people in bondage, I miss the word people, by reminding them of their past failures. Yeah, let me, once restored, don't keep people in bondage by reminding them of their past failures. Don't we do that? Come on, y'all, don't we do that? That's not the heart of God, right? So let's read, let's read, let's read. Notice what Paul says. If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Stop. If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Come on, say, if... Then say then. then. One more time. Say if. Then. Say then. then. Okay. In, in grammar, in grammar, there's what's known as the protasis and the apodosis. That's the if and the then. Okay. So here's what that means. If this situation is true, then I expect this behavior. Okay. Now, the reason I'm belaboring this point is because, because the if clause exists, it doesn't mean that the contents of the if clause is true. The then clause verifies the truthfulness of the if clause. Y'all with me? Let me help y'all. Brothers, cover your ears for a little while because I'm going to get in trouble with y'all. So here's what this looks like, ladies. You've been dating him for six years. And then here's your protasis or your if clause. If you love me, then you marry me. Eight years later, you're still on that protasis, apodasis thing. If you love me, then you marry me. Now, I don't want to get in trouble with nobody, but I have to say this. This is my illustration. I'm not talking about nobody. Nine years later, you done moved in. If, if you love me, then you'll marry me. Well, apparently the if clause isn't true. <laughs> because the then clause <laughs> is not verifying or substantiating the veracity or the truthfulness of the if clause. You kind of get what I'm saying? 
So, so Paul is using the same argument with Philemon, and he uses an interesting word. He uses the word koinonia, or koinonon, which says to Philemon, listen, if you and I have fellowship, if you and I serve the same God, if you and I are in relationship, then I'm not worried about anything because the then clause says that you're going to do what the if clause is trying to prove. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because we walk together, because we serve the same God, because we are in relationship with God, your behavior is going to be a reflection of that relationship with God. So get this, if I am doing a certain things with the then clause that isn't consistent with the if clause, So I can't say I'm in relationship with God here, but I don't like people here. <laughs> Y'all all right? Y'all all right? Okay. So, so he says, if you are my partner, and then notice what he says, receive him as you would receive me. Let me tell you what that means. That word receive is an interesting Greek word, right? Proslambanos. Here's what it means. Don't hold his past against him just like you don't hold my past against me. Oh my gosh. All right, preacher, I got a problem. I guess my if clause ain't true then because I ain't letting that go. You don't know what they did to me. <laughs> and this is what we do. A person had a rough past. A person might have blown it. They might have messed up. They might have done some crazy stuff. But God got a hold of them. I want y'all to hear me. And God did a new work. And the first thing we want to do as believers in Christ, we say we love God on the if, we say we have fellowship, but we won't receive them like we would receive Christ. Paul's saying, listen, when he comes home, don't, don't do that. Do, do like you would do me, right? Do like you would do me. Don't treat him like that. Treat him completely differently. And then, and then notice what he says. If he has wronged you at all or if he owes you anything, he says, charge it to my account. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. If Jesus ain't in this text. Now, now, don't read O to say that, see, he stole money. See, preacher, you're wrong. He stole. O doesn't necessarily mean that. O could have a variety of meaning. It could be the fact that the lost wages, the time he spent in Rome, it could be a whole lot of things that it means. But what Paul is saying, because of my partnership with you, because of my partnership with God, I am willing to bear the brunt of the pain of the burden so this relationship could be like how God wants it to be. Wow. Let me go on. And then verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand, and then he says, I will repay it. Pause. So what Paul is saying here in English, I'm signing this letter. This is my signature to verify the truth, and I'm going to take care of it. And then watch number, the next phrase. I like this. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. I got pause. Because this, 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 is, this, is, this, is, this is good stuff. Onesimus, let me tell you how to make it right. Here's what you got to do, blah, 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 blah. Now, don't forget, you owe me you. Now, what I like about that, I feel as if Paul is saying, Onesimus, I mean Philemon, don't forget, you used to be useless. But for the grace of God... You're now used. Yeah, 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 yeah. Excuse me, let me go on a rant for a little while. There is nothing more frustrating to me than to see believers of Christ who used to be strung out on drugs, come on, who had premarital sex, who had abortions, come on, who had divorces, who've been through all kinds of sick stuff to see a young child in Christ going through the same thing, and we look down at them with our nose as if we had not done that at some point in time. Here's what Paul is saying. Philemon, don't forget the fact that used to be you, 
but for the grace of God, where God had me in your life, so you owe me, because you used to be like him. <sighs> that ought to motivate you. Come on, that, 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 are you with me? You see, the problem is, the problem is God brings you through and we forgot what it was that God brought us from and we ride this wave of our holiness in our sanctification and act like we hadn't done nothing while the world is going to hell in a handbasket and we have in good church. No, 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 no. You need to go out there and tell the Onesimuses of the world, I used to lie. I used to steal. I used to cheat. I used to fornicate. I used to commit a Tree. I used to get high, but for the grace of God. So Philemon, before you get too holy and want to put him on a trial period, check yourself, because that used to be you. Mike and I were joking yesterday with Stephanie and was it Kathy uh, about, you know, we, we were poor coming up. Food stamps, cheese and shoe boxes. Y'all don't know about that. Y'all live in Castle Pines. Come on. Had to go in the food stamp line. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? We remember the days. And sometimes in your evangelistic tactic, you need to remember the days. Are you hearing me? I will never forget when we first started this church, every week I would go bring my lunch and I would go sit on Colfax and Dayton with the homeless people and I would have lunch with them. And they would say to me, preacher, why? One, one, day, one of them, Billy, asked me, why do you keep coming out here having lunch with us? I said, because at 19 years old, that used to be me. You used to be me. Eating out of trash cans, living on the street, had no place to lay my hand. And because God brought me out, I need not forget you. I've got to come back and sit with you because the same God that brought me out can bring you out. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah. The same God that brought me out. The same God that delivered me. So Philemon, before you get too holy, before you get too righteous, before you forget where you came from, don't forget you owe me your life. And ch church is sad, it's sad when God has to get there with us because we've forgotten our yesterday. Come on, y'all. It's okay to let it go. It's okay to forget it, but it ought to be the thing that drives us back in. The reason God said to Moses, I need you to go to Pharaoh to tell him, let my people go, is because Moses used to live there. He knew the language. Come on. He knew the dress. He knew the culture. He knew the passcode. He knew, come on, come on. And some of y'all act like you don't know gang signs. You know it all. Come on. You act like you don't know. Come on. You know what it's like. Use it to go back in. You owe me. You owe me. You owe me your life. And what I like about, what I like about this text, and, and, and I'm done, but what I really like about the text it's just a couple of things. When I look at this, I see Jesus all over this because Paul, it says, took on the form of a slave in that he humbled himself. I, I am in prison. I'm an old man. He took a posture of humility. And I couldn't help but think of Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, who being, come on, he humbled himself, took on the form of a servant. God took on the form of a servant just for you and just for me. And I like this because Paul served as a mediator between Onesimus and Philemon. God is serving as mediator. Come on, come on, come on. I mean, Jesus is serving as mediator between sin and God so I can have access. He went to Calvary and he died in my place. I should have been the one on that cross. Come on. I should have been the one dying, but he did it all for me. And here's the other thing that I, that I really like about what this is saying. Come on, get over there. You're messing up my groove. Yeah, Paul was willing to pay the price of redemption. In other words, Jesus went to Calvary when we should have been the one on the cross. He paid the price so we have access to God. He paid it all. And then look at this. I owe him. Yeah, Philemon owed Paul his life. 
I owe Christ my life. But for the grace of God, y'all heard me say this. Hymnist said it back, then, back in the day, Jesus paid it all. It says, all to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but his blood has washed it white as snow. So here's what he says to the enemy. If he did anything wrong, charge it to my account. I thank God for that. If he robs you, charge it to my account. If he sinned, charge it to my account. If he failed, charge it to my account. Because the blood of Jesus, come on, cleanses me from all unrighteousness and presents me faultless before a holy, a wise, and a just God. Charge it to my account. Here's what this says. And I'm done. Said this last week, I won't say it again. Now, regardless of my past, your past, our past, as children of God, here's the work. We should treat each other as equal members of God's family. Here's what this dialogue might look like Wednesday. We have black church, white church, Hispanic church, Asian church, Republican church, Democratic church. Come on, y'all. And we have lines drawn in the sand because we don't see each other as equal members of God's family. Amen. So here's how the sermon started. Two weeks ago, we looked down our noses, classism in the body of Christ, as people who are different from us. I don't know that that's biblical. I don't know. Matter of fact, I believe it's not biblical. And if the world is going to come to a relationship with God, some things has to change in the church of God. I think this passage says something. I really, really do. And my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that if I have fellowship with God, then I will receive each other as I receive Christ. Bow your heads with me. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, we love you. Holy Spirit, we praise you. Holy Spirit, we magnify your name. Difficult, difficult passage. Easy to walk out in the spirit. More difficult to do in the flesh. Generations upon generations upon generations. And your very church has not gotten it right yet. We want to at least attempt. Scripture is clear. In Christ there is no Jew, no Gentile, male, no free male, no slave, no free. We're all one in Christ. That songwriter got it right when he said we're one in the spirit, we're one in the Lord. And here's what you say in the Bible. Father, as you and I are one, Make them one. That's what your word says. We want to receive each other, God. Not so much restored relationships, but different relationships. With God at the forefront. With God reigning. Forgive us. Forgive me. Forgive every person in here for not being Christ-like. Teach us to love each other. Teach us to release. Teach us to forgive. Teach us to be who you would have us to be. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name.